Uh, we're going to look first at radiation sources, where radiation comes from. In the first place, you hear about radiation. Let's see what some of the sources are. Look at the identification of nuclear particles, things that actually come out of the nucleus. So go way back to Dalton and remember that it was just all one nucleus indivisible. Now it's got all sorts of stuff inside of it. We're going to look at how we complete nuclear equations, how we finish a nuclear equation, see what kind of products are going to form. And we're also going to look at half-lives. Uh, half-lives you may have heard about most likely in like radiocarbon dating would be the primary example you might have heard of them in. <coughs> This diagram comes out of the textbook, actually shows the radiation sources uh, naturally occurring. Actually, are they all naturally occurring? Um, no, not all naturally occurring. But it shows you the radiation sources. A big blue arrow that says natural 82%. shows you that 82% of the radiation that we have, that we are exposed to, actually is natural in nature. Um, and 55% of that is radon. Radon is our primary source of radiation. Radon is that noble gas sitting down there toward the bottom of the noble gas group. Uh, but radon actually is a decomposition product of some areas in the country that have some high uh, certain types of ore content, and so it is a it is a problem. You can actually look up maps on the internet that shows you where radon might be an issue. Uh, <coughs> you see others on here too: occupational, uh, nuclear fuel cycles, things of that nature, medical X-rays, nuclear medicine, consumer products, all sorts of things like that. And there is quite a bit. And actually, when you fly in airplanes, you pick up some radiation once you get up higher. And there's, as you do radiation estimation sometimes, they take into account how many times you fly in order to get an idea of what your radiation exposure is. But the type of radiation we're most concerned with is called ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation sounds like it makes ions, which is what it does. It knocks electrons <coughs> out of atoms and forms ions. If you want to know about your personal radiation exposure, you can go ahead and look at this website I have listed here. Uh, it asks you how many times you do this and do that and do the other thing. You kind of get an idea about what the uh, what your exposure looks like. The basic unit they use is called a milliram. Uh, typically in the United States, the average dosage is about 620 milligrams. Uh, several of you indicated when in the introductory part that your teachers are interested in teaching. If you go to this USA Radtown site I have listed here in the APA, there's actually some activities your kiddos can do, your students can do, related to um, radiation, radiation exposure, and all sorts of things of that nature. You might want to take that, take a look at that and see. In looking at nuclear, we call it nuclear chemistry, there's really not that much chemistry involved in it. It's mostly all involved in the nucleus. Think about what we've done so far. So far, we've been involved in ionic and molecular types of compounds. We think about the nucleus as a small, very small uh, set of positive and neutron, uh, positive charges and neutrons at the center of the atom, and then a big electron cloud around the outside. And as atoms come together, those electron clouds interact, and they either share electrons or they transfer electrons or something along those lines. Well, here we're changing our focus a little bit. Now, instead of worrying about those electron clouds on the outside, we're going to focus on the nucleus and see what happens in a nucleus when it undergoes a decay or undergoes some kind of another process that might be, might be of interest to us. There are basically five types of decay that we look at, um, all involving very small particles that come out of or actually sometimes would be, go into a particular nucleus. And so everything we're going to talk about here is focused on the nucleus. We're talking about the nucleus. So let's take a look at these five particles real quickly and see what we have. First one is called an alpha particle. You might remember the alpha particle because... Uh, he, he came in early when we talked about Rutherford's experiment. The alpha particle is really just a helium nucleus is all it is. If you take a helium atom, it has two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. And if you strip away the electrons, all you have left is a nucleus. It's two protons and two neutrons. It has a mass of four, because remember, each proton is one and each neutron is one. It has a charge of two, because it has two protons in the nucleus. Beta particles are actually electrons. If you want to think of it that way, and a beta particle has no mass, virtually no mass, uh, and it has a minus one charge. So it's just like an electron that we might be looking at. A gamma ray is, has no mass and actually has no charge. A gamma ray is really just sort of a packet of energy is what it amounts to. And so the, the first guy up there, the alpha, is a big heavy particle. The beta is not so heavy, but he's a particle nonetheless. Gamma is not even a particle. Look at a positron now. A positron is kind of like a positive electron. 
if you want to get really confused. But a positron has no mass and has a plus one charge, as opposed to the beta particle up there that has no mass and has a minus one charge. Now we talk about a process called electron capture, where an electron capture, a nucleus actually sucks an electron in. Okay, and we'll see kind of what happens in that in just a minute. A little bit more description of these, just so we can get a better idea maybe of what we look like in the alpha particle. It's composed, I said earlier, comprised of two protons, two neutrons. <laughs> it really is a helium nucleus. As you look at the chart down below, you'll see that it really just has to make up the composition of a helium nucleus. If you look at a beta particle, it's an electron that's been emitted, kicked out of the nucleus. Okay, now we didn't think about electrons as being the nucleus before, but you might think of it like this. If you think about a Think about a neutron as being like a positive and a minus charge stuck together. If it kicks out the negative charge, it leaves a positive charge behind, doesn't it? It leaves a proton charge behind. And so you kind of, when you think about the nucleus, it's much more complicated than what we've told you so far. The gamma ray is not a particle, just a burst of energy. No mass, doesn't affect the charge at all on any of the species. It's just a bundle of energy coming out. The positron is the positive electron. It has the same mass as an electron does, just has an opposite charge. So it would be a plus one charge. Now, the electron capture is, is where it actually sucks in an electron from the outside. Okay? And so the nucleus takes an electron in, which is not something you're used to at this point. We have a way of writing symbols for isotopes, but you already know this, because this is way back from unit 11 or so. Now we're going to represent isotopes the same way we did before. That's comforting, isn't it? We'll use the chemical symbol. The atomic number will be a subscript on the lower left, and the mass number will be up on a you know, superscript on the right, on the left, also on the left-hand side. So you see it up there in the top row, or written as an AZX type of symbol. A is the mass number, Z is the atomic number. Look at the examples down below. They may look familiar because I think they're the same ones I used before. Carbon has six protons. Uh, if it has six neutrons, it has a mass number of 12, doesn't it? And so that's what the carbon symbol would look like. C with a six and a 12. Chlorine is indicated there, and hydrogen is indicated down below that. Remember, the mass number on top is just the sum of the protons and however many neutrons that nuclide has. Nuclide's a term we like to use for these nuclear types of symbols. is if in the top row, looking at the alpha decay, there's an alpha particle that comes out. And one of the ways we can write it is, since it is a helium nucleus, we can write it just like a helium with a 2 and a 4 on it. It's a helium nucleus. The beta particle, uh, the Greek letter beta, and we use a subscript and a superscript. Remember, the charge on that is minus 1, so it's written as a subscript to the down to the lower left. And then the mass is 0, so there's 0 for the mass as, as a superscript. Look at the gamma particle. It's got nothing to it, but it's gamma. So we use the Greek letter gamma for that. Look at a positron emission. We're going to use a beta particle again, a beta symbol again. But now notice how it's different than the beta particle above is the charge is plus one, and that's written down the lower uh, left front of that symbol. And then electron capture, we'll typically indicate that was just the E for electron. Uh, has a minus one charge, and as you see on the right-hand side, it has a minus one as the, basically as the atomic number, kind of a funny atomic number, isn't it? And it has a mass number of zero, virtually no mass to it. So let's take a look at writing nuclear equations. It might look awful to start with, but actually as long as you can do addition and subtraction, you're fine. There's not a whole lot of multiplying even involved in this. So to write a balanced nuclear equation, the big challenge is that we have to conserve the mass and the charge on both sides of the equation, okay? So we have to make sure uh, that, that both the upper numbers, the superscripts and the subscripts match. So in this equation here, when I look at the superscripts right there, what you'll see is uranium with a 238, thorium has a 234, and helium has a 4. Look where the arrow is, the, arrow, the equation arrow is, and the uranium is the only thing on the left-hand side has 238 for that upper number, that means that when I look on the right-hand side, those two numbers have to add up to 238 also, and they do. Thorium is 234, helium is a 4, gives me 238. 
if I look at the subscripts there, what do I see? Well, uranium is 92, and on the right-hand side I have 90 for thorium, and I've got a 2 for helium, so it adds up to 92. All I have to do is make sure the superscripts add up the same on both sides, and the subscripts add up the same on both sides. If there's anything tricky about this, which by the way there's not, but if there were anything tricky about this is what if you have a missing species, you want to figure out what it is. That sounds like fun, doesn't it? So let's try that. So here's an equation. We've got radium. We're in the left-hand side. We're making some x. We don't know what that is. It's some element. And we have an atomic number z for it. And we have a mass number a for it. And then we have an alpha particle we've emitted. And so we need to figure out what that missing species is going to be. So what do we do? We look at the superscripts. And on the left-hand side, the radium adds up to 226. That's the only thing there, isn't it? On the right-hand side, I get 4 from helium. And whatever a is has to add up with the 4 to make 226, <laughs> like it is on the left-hand side. And so when you think about that, 4 plus what equals 226? And the answer would be 222. So I know that, that upper number, that A, on the right-hand side is going to be 222. That's the only way the superscripts are going to add up. Now if I look down below, what happens down below? Well, down below I have 88 on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, I get 2 from helium, and so the z there, the missing z, has to be something such that when I take z and add it to 2, I get 88. So what number is that? That's got to be 86, doesn't it? Okay, so my symbol, my missing symbol has 86 for the subscript and has 222 for the mass number. Okay, how do I know which element that is? Once I have the atomic number, I know. I go to a periodic chart, I look up which element has atomic number 86, and that's what that's going to be, and it turns out in the very bottom, there's the equation written out, that's radon. And so this is an example of radium, and this is actually is where radon comes from sometimes in, in natural settings, is radium decays and produces radon and also <laughs> helium, alpha particles. A little bit more, just to make sure we kind of get this down. Um, very often these come up in life as sort of word problems. So instead of having an equation looking at it and trying to figure it out, you have to figure it out from the words. So let's look at an example here. What particle is emitted when thorium-231 decays to protactinium-231? Now, 231 is the mass number. That's why they can have the same mass number. Okay? They, they can't have the same atomic number, but they can have the same mass number. So first thing you do is you write the equation representing what you think you know, which is thorium-231 is over there on the left-hand side. You know 231 is a superscript. And since it's thorium and you're looking at a periodic chart, you can figure out the atomic number has to be 90. Okay? Then on the other side, you're going to emit something, some particles. Call that a Z and an A, and I put a question mark there <laughs> so we don't know what element that is. And then the other thing that I'm making is protactinium. <coughs> and it tells me up there that 231 is a mass number, so I've got it, 231 is the mass number on that. And I look at my periodic chart and find out protactinium has an atomic number of 91. If I look at the superscripts on the left, did I do arrows or not? Yes, I did, okay. If I look at the arrows on the top, I didn't do them well, but I did them 231 on the left for thorium, and on the right-hand side you have 231 for protactinium hidden under that arrow. So what does the A have to be? Well, for 231 to equal 231, you're going to add something to it. The A has to be 0, doesn't it? So now I know that the A has got to be 0. If I look at the subscripts now, and I look down below, and I see I have a 90 on the left, and on the right-hand side, I covered it up again, 91 for protactinium. So that Z then has to be what? Well, if I want 91 plus something to equal 90, that something has to be a minus 1. I'm taking 1 away from 91, aren't I? And so my missing symbol, my missing particle, has a minus 1 as a subscript, a 0 as a superscript, and I have my question mark there. So you sit there and say, okay, what is that? Well, obviously you're not going to find a minus 1 atomic number in the periodic chart. Those are all positive, aren't they? And so what you have to do is figure out which subatomic particle this is going to be. So you look at your little table of, of particles over there on the right-hand side. Which one has a minus 1 and 0? Well, there's the beta particle, isn't it? And that's exactly what you get as a beta particle. Now, if you're inquiry, and you have an inquiring mind, and you look down further, you say, wait a minute, the electron capture is the same thing, a minus one and a zero. Remember, electron capture 
is capturing something. That's going to have to be on the left-hand side of the equation, not on the right. It's not given up. It's taken in. And so he does, he's not an eligible guy. He's not an eligible receiver in this particular <coughs> equation. Here, down at the bottom, you go back to this one, what does it tell you? It tells you if it, this is going to be one-fourth, then it has to have gone through two half-lives, because one-half times one-half is one-fourth. And so it's been through two half-lives. Since each, each half-life is 5,730 years, time elapsed is 11,460 years. That's how old this thing is from this Egyptian tomb. That's the end of Unit 30, and for that matter, the fact of, as a matter of fact, the end of all the presentations for the semester. I hope you've gotten something out of them in the course of this. I know we probably all have mixed